Our Old Testament reading comes from Amos, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations, to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Calne and see, and from there go to Hamath the great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? O oh, you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. Here ends the Old Testament reading. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to thee, O Lord. The epistle reading comes from 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Now there is a great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from the reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to, joy, to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Here ends the epistle reading. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to thee, O Lord. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that you, in your lifetime, received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. 
And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to thee. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear these words of Jesus. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Perhaps you've seen movies or read stories about somebody who went from rags to riches. Someone who grew up a commoner and then became a princess. Someone who didn't have it and then they did. Somebody who perhaps struck it rich, mining for some precious mineral or somebody who won the lottery. Maybe you've thought of uh, what would it be like if that happened to you? What would it be like to be able to all of a sudden just step back from all of the, the cares and the concerns of this world, to not wonder where that next paycheck was going to come from or if it was going to be enough to make it till the end of the month? Your friends in Christ, the idea of a rags to riches kind of story is one that I think all of us pine for to some degree or another. Perhaps that's because uh, deeply ingrained within us is a, a love for stuff, a love for the things of this world. You know, we are people who are called, as St. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, to walk by faith and not by sight. But I know that I wouldn't make it very far without my own perception, without my own eyesight, without my own ability to see the way that things are in the world and to adapt and to adjust accordingly. You know, you see that things are going maybe not the best as they could be in the economy or in the markets or in your retirement account. And all of a sudden you decide that you need to pivot, you need to change because you want to make sure that there's going to be enough money left over for whatever comes next. It's only natural. Unfortunately, though, sometimes we take that it's only natural and we maybe we lean a little bit too hard into that. That's why St. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 6 this morning that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And we always have to point out with that particular verse that it is the love of money. It is not money itself. Money is amoral. It is simply a piece, a part of creation with which God blesses us so that we may clothe ourselves and our family members, so that we may feed our children, so that we may uh, subsist and not all of us have to go out and to do all of the hard work of being farmers, but instead some of us can be, do the hard work of being pastors or do the hard work of being a banker or hard work of being a teacher, the hard work of being a plumber, an electrician. Well, you get the idea. So the problem was never money at all. The problem is always a little bit deeper below the surface. The problem is always with each and every one of us. Because what we see in this world, we think, is what we get. We are people who are very, very driven by our eyes and our ears, by our reason and our intellect. And our eyes and our ears, our reason and our intellect tells us that more of that stuff, that green stuff or those numbers on the screen at the bank, more of that, well, it means an easier life. 
Perhaps it means uh, I can be a blessing to other people in more ways than one. Unfortunately, sometimes money becomes an idol. It becomes the means by which we experience the good things in this life rather than looking to God as the one who gives all good gifts. So that's why in our Old Testament lesson today from the book of Amos, and dear friends, I know that we preached Amos last Sunday and that we're preaching Amos today. I think this is the last time we're going to be in Amos for quite some time. So you can all breathe a sigh of relief as soon as you walk out of church today. Nevertheless, in Amos chapter 6, the prophet Amos, remember he's from the southern kingdom of Judah and he's preaching in the northern kingdom of Israel, also called Samaria. He begins to call out against his cousins, his kinfolks, Woe! Woe to you who are at ease! First of all, those down in the southern kingdom in Jerusalem, those in Zion, woe to them who are at ease, but also woe to those who feel secure in the north on the Mount of Samaria. Woe to both of them. Because you see, they have built themselves up from nothing. It's a rags to riches story. You remember when Israel was nothing, when they were in slavery in Egypt, when they were a bygone nation among all the nations? And then God, in his great mercy, stretched out his arm and pulled them, drew them, dragged them at times kicking and screaming across the Red Sea, throughout the wilderness, and then he planted them in the promised land. And my, how things have turned for the better for them. Because you see, by the time Amos is preaching, Israel and even Judah in the south, they are living their best lives. Things are great. There is relative peace, prosperity. There are trade deals that are going through. I guess you could say the economy was booming. And what happens when things go well in that realm? Well, people become complacent. People begin to think that they deserve to have things this well. People actually start to forget that God is the giver of every good gift. They think that they've done it all themselves. Look what we have built. It's almost like the builders of the Tower of Babel. As they're there laying hardened brick upon hardened brick. Who can stop us now? We all know that pride comes before the fall. We all know that those who think that they've got their lives figured out. Without any mention of God whatsoever. Well they're going to wind up like the poor rich man in Luke 16. Did you notice that in that parable that Jesus gives, the rich man's name is never even mentioned? He's forgotten. He's not even spoken of by name. But instead, Lazarus, that man who had nothing to cling to but the promises of God, Lazarus is the name who we remember, who Jesus proclaims, and who we say, that's the one in the parable that I want to be like. If it means that everything else in this life has to slip away, my health, my wealth, everything around me, then so be it for the sake of that which is to come. Now, unfortunately, when Amos preached, the people wouldn't listen. The people wouldn't hear what he had to deliver. He talked about those who would put off the day of disaster, but then bring near to them violence. This reminds me of Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant. Remember when the servant owes his master more than he could ever repay. And he says to him, have mercy on me, be lenient with me, give me a little bit more time and I can pay it back. What does the master say? He says, go your way. He's pushed away the day of disaster. But then that wicked servant finds someone else who owes him just a little bit of money and he says the very same thing does that lesser servant. Please be merciful. Have patience with me. Give me just a little bit more time. The first servant grabs him by the throat. He does violence to the man who cannot repay him. And time and time again, he had been shown that very same mercy. 
Amos preaches against those who are comfortable. Amos says, Woe to those who are lying on beds. The frames are made of ivory. They stretch themselves out on nice couches. They eat the finest of the flock, the best of the calves. They spend all of their time composing music instead of dealing with what's right in front of them. They drink wine in bowls. Cups aren't big enough. They anoint themselves with the finest of oils, but they are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. And again, there's a connection in here. It's almost as if uh, Amos is recalling to himself the history of Israel. Because you see, all the way back in Genesis 37, I'm sure you haven't been in Genesis 37 in a while. This is when Joseph's brothers throw him down into the pit. They strip off his robe. They tear it into pieces. They throw him down into that deep pit with the intention to leave him there to die. And then verse 25 says this, Then they sat down to eat. It's only then that they look up and they saw the caravan of slave drivers coming from Gilead with their camels and then they decided that maybe they should sell him into slavery instead of leaving him to die. They sat down to eat as their brother was in the pit calling out to them, asking for mercy, asking for them to to stop playing the trick on him, asking for their cruelness to come to an end. Perhaps he even prayed to God, God, turn their hearts that they might deliver me. Dear friends in Christ, where do we find ourselves in the midst of a sort of a hard to wrestle with text? Like Luke chapter 16 or like Amos chapter 6. What do we make of something like this? Most of us who are, I can probably say all of us who are well above the poverty line, We don't experience what it is to have true hunger, to have a bank account that is absolute zero and to have your health falling apart all around you at the same time. Unfortunately, dear friends in Christ, I think that when we read Amos 6, we're supposed to find ourselves on the receiving end of those woes from Amos. And it's not an easy thing for us to hear. It's not easy to be the rich man in St. Luke's parable in chapter 16. Well, Amos is calling us, and I believe Jesus is likewise calling us to repent. That's the message that's buried in these pages and in these words, is that we are to repent, to turn away from our love for selfish gain, for the stuff that we've got in this life. And no one said it would be easy but it sure is worth it. Hear these words, the final two or three verses of our epistle lesson. St. Paul says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them. St. Paul is charging you and me today not to be haughty. That is, not to be more full of ourselves than we ought to be. Not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Because who knows what the stock market's going to do in the next quarter. (laughs) But instead to set their hopes on God. For God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They, we are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves for ourselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Dear friends, what our texts are telling us today is that we can let go of so many things in this life, but never Jesus. Cling fast to Jesus The best news of all is that it's not only you reaching and grabbing for Jesus, but it works the other way, even more so. That Jesus reaches out and he grabs onto you in the waters of holy baptism. You have been united to Jesus' own death, burial, and resurrection. You have been given a new life that is hidden away in him. So that where he is, there you will be also. 
Dear friends, knowing who Jesus is, knowing how Jesus loves you, well, it, it makes it a little easier for us to let go of the concerns of this life, for us to walk throughout each and every day with a few fewer anxieties, cares, the things that would drag us down and the things that would cause us to say, you know, I just can't do that thing that will help my brother or sister in Christ. I can't serve my neighbor in that way right now because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Instead, Jesus says, I'll take care of tomorrow. In fact, I'll take care of forever. That's the joy that we have in Christ is that there is a time coming when we will experience we will experience that the wait is worth it. And until then, we'll continue to concern ourselves with God's word. Even when his word tells us that we are the problem, repent and believe in the gospel. We'll hear that word of Moses, the prophets, the evangelists, so that we might trust in the one who has been raised from the dead. That's the beauty of the gospel is that we have one who has been raised from the dead and we have Moses and the prophets, the evangelists. We have Paul and we have even John who wrote the Revelation. We've got all of that for us to point us to Jesus so that we may not lose heart, but instead we might wait with patience. So dear friends, wait with patience for the coming of our Lord Jesus and until then, love one another. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he comes again. Amen.